Hello, everyone. This is Philip Shields. I'm talking today about a day that I call the forgotten day in God's calendar, the forgotten day. Too many ministers don't even mention it. And we omit a very important and exciting day, though it's not a holy day. It's a tremendously awesome day that includes you and me. It's Wave Chief Day. What a, so, so that's what we'll talk about today. It comes between the um, first day of unleavened bread and the last day of unleavened bread. And it's the day after the weekly Sabbath that falls during the days of unleavened bread. What a year it's been. April 17, 2022 is the day of first fruits of barley, the wave sheaf day, when Jesus rose up uh, to meet his God and Father in heaven after all the time here on earth. And it also happens this year, 2022, to be Easter. Uh, when most of the world's Christian churches call themselves Christian are keeping, they think, the resurrection also of Christ. It's the same day this year. But they add the Easter egg and the bunny and all that kind of thing, which we don't do. And so I want to speak about the biblical day, wave sheaf day today. We also know that anyone can research the history of Easter and find out that it has a lot of pagan roots. Wave Sheaf Day has no pagan roots. It's directly the day given to us by Yeshua, by, by God himself, uh, way back in, in the Leviticus 23. We'll talk some about that. <clears throat> anyway, this is the day Yeshua, Jesus, rose to be accepted by his Father, on behalf of the rest of the harvest, that we would be accepted because of him, because of that wave sheaf, that, that the wave sheaf pictured, pictured Christ. We'll read that right now, Leviticus 23, verses 9 to 11. And I think you'll see why we need to have this topic, and we need to use some time tomorrow, wave sheaf day, to... Uh, just thank God for Jesus Christ and thank Jesus for him for himself and how much we appreciate everything this day means. Leviticus 23, verses 9 to 11. It was barley they're talking about here, which was the every, everyday man's uh, bread and flour. It was cheaper than wheat. And that's what God picked to represent his very son. So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits, an omer of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave or raise that sheaf before Jehovah. It wasn't actually a sheaf as we think of the word sheaf. This was the grain from that sheaf. It was all ground down really fine into very fine barley flour. They said so fine that if the priest put his hand in it, nothing would stick to his hand. That fine. That fine. He shall wave the sheaf before Yehovah to be accepted on your behalf. To be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath. I'm not going to take all the time right here, but that refers to the weekly Sabbath. Because otherwise, why would you count 50 days if it was always a known end point, which it would be if you took it from the first holy day. But anyway, so my point is, you shall count 50 days, but to be accepted on your behalf. Wave sheaf day during the days of unleavened bread has always been a regular work day in my life and everyone's life. But I think we should pause at least and remember it, thanking God for what he did and what Yehovah did on this day. It's such an exciting day. With, I hope I can convey that. Oh, God, help me. This day is about how after the Passover, the Lamb of God was raised from the dead, ascended to the throne in heaven to be accepted as the first of the first fruits of those God is calling and starting the salvation process of um, the first fruits. And I'll give a sermon at some, at some time soon, I hope. Is this the only day of salvation? And how God has a timetable for uh, calling, resurrecting, and having people added to his family. Today, I call this the forgotten day. Uh, people have turned into Easter sunrise service and forgotten wave sheath day, have never kept it, should not be omitted or forgotten. Please note 
that Christ said he would be in the heart of the earth in a tomb, Passover day, okay, which the year that that happened to Yeshua was on a Wednesday. Passover day uh, was when he died. He said the only proof that he would give that he was the Messiah was in Matthew 12, verses 39 to 40. And he said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the, of the, of the, of the belly of the fish and, and the sea, uh, I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Not parts of three days and nights. There's no way you're going to get three days, which is 12 hours, and three nights, another 12 hours each, I mean, total of 72 hours from a Friday night burial to early Sunday morning. But I'm, I'm going to rush through this part, but I'll have all the notes there because I don't want to make sure I get this in time to my, uh, to my webmaster because I need to get this in there tonight. Anyway, the reason for this uh, most most people think it's Friday because it talks about their being, and that day was the preparation day for the Sabbath. And everybody knows, or a lot of people know, that Friday every week is the preparation day to get ready for the weekly Sabbath. So everybody assumed that the crucifixion had to be on the preparation day for the weekly Sabbath, which was Friday. Then they try to make it all fit in, and you can't get three days and three nights. And if he wasn't three days and three nights in the tomb, then uh, he was not the Messiah, because he said that's the only sign he would give. But he did fulfill it. But the day before God's annual, annual holy days, the holy days of God, are also called a preparation day. And the annual holy days are also called Sabbaths. Go back to Leviticus 23. These are my Sabbaths. Okay, they're called the Sabbath. Even the Jews today, it's a high day. It's called a high day, high day Sabbath. One of the annual holy days. That night, at the end of the 14th of Abib, or Nisan, and start of the 15th, started the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. And Jews didn't want dying men on crosses as they came to their first holy day, starting the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we read in John 19, 31, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, for the preparation day for the holy day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. John 19, 31. Jews asked Pilate to break their legs, all three of them up there. Um, they found that they didn't have to break Jesus' legs because he was already dead. But anyway, my point is they would break the legs and, and they could support themselves up to get their breath. So they would really die of asphyxiation at that point. So anyway, preparation day mentioned here. And elsewhere is, is uh, are referring not to Friday, but to the day before the first holy day. So that day was Wednesday. The first holy day was Thursday, an annual Sabbath. So preparation day was the day he died, Wednesday. And then the next day was a holy day, a Sabbath. And then Friday would be another preparation day for the weekly Sabbath. You get it? There are two weekly preparation days that particular week. And that's why there's confusion as to when he died. We know that before daylight, while it was still dark, women went to the tomb and found it already empty. So sometime before that point, if you find that your house, someone has broken into your house, let's say you find that, that out at 4 p.m., well, you don't, you won't, you wouldn't say that they broke in at 4 p.m. You know that by 4 p.m. they had broken in. So sometime before that, same way here, uh, they 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 came while it was still dark, and found that the tomb was empty. So when was he placed in the tomb? Scripture is clear that it was just minutes before the sun was setting on Passover day, Luke 23 verses. 53 and 54. And so uh, they took the body of Christ down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of rock for, where no one had been lain before. And that day, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. The Sabbath, the annual Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread, drew near. So they're right at the point of sundown because Holy days and Sabbath every day begins with sundowns and ends with sundown. And that Sabbath, John 19, 31, reminds us that Sabbath was a high day, holy day. 
So three days and three nights after Wednesday night would take us up to Saturday night, just before sundown. And yes, the tomb would be empty when the women went there early the next day because he would be resurrected exactly three days and three nights later as the sun was going down, what we would know as Saturday night. Okay? And so then he had to wait until the next day to go up. And uh, John 20, verse 1. Now the first of the weeks. It's no word day there. It's not first day of the week. It's first of the weeks. Which when you started counting the Omer. You started counting the 50 days. To Shavuot. To Pentecost. On the first of the weeks, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark. And while it was still dark. Now I know one of the other ones says that sunrise or sun had come up or something but this one here says while it was still dark somewhere in there maybe some other women came later but saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb so sometime between sundown saturday night and sunrise sunday morning the next morning christ has already been resurrected by christ's own words he had to be in the belly of the earth the heart of the earth for three days and three nights so what did he do? He was already resurrected. What, what, what was Jesus waiting for? He was waiting for a ceremony from the high priest to start that would fulfill, and then he would fulfill the meaning of that ceremony that pointed to him, called the, waving, the raising up of the wave sheaf at 9 a.m. at the exact moment when the high priest raises the first fruits of barley. So he did show himself to Mary Magdalene before that, probably well before 9 a.m., and the story is in John 20. I ask you to read it. Uh, he asked her not to cling to him as he had to go to his father and her father, to his God and her God. John 20, verse 17. The high priest every year on the wave sheaf day would take that first fruits barley that had been ground into really fine flour and would raise it up at 9 a.m. and then lower his hands back, down, now, that's very important that you pick that up. He raised it up and lowered it down all on the same day. So I am sure Yeshua was raised exactly the same moment that the time of day, I mean, that he was put into the tomb at sundown and then exactly the same moment that the high priest would be raising up the barley would be exactly the same thing where Yeshua finally would go see his father and so on. And so that's why we see in John 20, verses 14 to 17, you can read the whole story later on your own, but Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, is very upset. The tomb's empty. There's no body there. She's really upset. Someone's stolen this body. And uh, verse 15, Jesus comes to her. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. I'll pick him up. <laughs> you know, Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means my teacher. My rabbi, my teacher. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. Okay, he was, I'm sure she was trying to hug him. I have not yet ascended to my father. You gotta let me go, Mary. You gotta go up. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending. I mean, isn't that amazing that any of us could call him our brother, that he would call any of us his brethren? But that's what he says. Go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So Christ was resurrected Saturday at sundown. Wave Chief Day is not just a day of remembering his resurrection, although it includes that. It's remembering he rose to his father to be accepted on behalf of the rest of us, the rest of the harvest. Leviticus 23, 9 to 11 says that. Jehovah spoke to Moses. Didn't I just read that? But oh, let's read it again. Uh, Jehovah spoke to Moses. Speak to the children of Israel. Say to them, when you come to the land, okay, bring the sheaf of first fruits of the harvest to the priest. And he, the priest, shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah to be accepted on your behalf. This day, you guys got to hear it, includes you. This day is about you being accepted. I'm talking about you and me. 
It's about us being accepted on Jesus' behalf or because of him. He's the first of the first fruits. God inspects him. God accepts him. Now the rest of the harvest can be accepted for harvest. The, the, the salvation of souls. You and I fail so often. I know I do. But because of Jesus, my Savior, I'm accepted by God the Father, by God Most High, whether you accept me or I accept you or anybody accepts me or you. You and I are accepted by God the Father. Why? Because we're in Him. And He, we are represented in Him. That we may be accepted on your behalf, it says. So wave chief days about when Yeshua went back home for a time to be accepted as the perfect first fruits, to meet up with Father again, with his Abba, his Daddy, God Most High, King of the Universe. We all know John 3.16, that God gave his only Son because he loved us all so much, and that was done on Passover day. The next verse is partly the meaning of this wave sheaf day. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God is all about reconciliation, showing that he's accepted us in spite of everything we've done, all the flaws we have when he first called us and we still have from time to time. So though wave sheaf day is not a holy day, neither should it be ignored. It's about you being accepted. Because of Christ. It's about Christ, but it includes you. The purpose is to accept you. Wave sheaf day during the days of unleavened bread has always been a regular work day in my life, but I think we should at least pause, all of us, and remember it, maybe at 9 a.m., and just start thanking our God in heaven, our dear Abba Father, and our King Jesus, Yeshua, for what God did for us and with us with this day. What an awesome day it is. Imagine with me, okay, so now at 9 a.m., First day of the week, first of, of the weeks, he rises up instantly as in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. Imagine with me what that scene in heavenly Jerusalem with this total flawless, flawless victory. If you count them as a perfect ten, this was a ten, this was a thousand. <laughs> it was flawless. And he's seen Mary Magdalene ascended. And now our king is home in heaven on wave sheaf day. And it had been more than 30, 30, 30 years, 33 years. Each day probably seemed like a thousand to each of them. Yeshua, the son of God, the son of man. Yeshua, the word of God who spoke everything into existence. Except for mankind whom he formed with his hands. Yeshua, the lion of Judah. Yeshua, the lamb of God. Yeshua, you and my brother, my king. My Prince of Peace, my friend, the one who loved me, the one who loved you, who loves you, was now entering victoriously into the area of the shimmering sea of glass before the very throne of God Most High, and all that dazzling brightness with thunders and fires and lightnings and rainbows and majesty coming to his Abba, his daddy. Can you imagine it? The Son of God had arrived home finally, in victory, flawless, 100% successful, now resurrected the Spirit fully, the Son of God, in every sense of the word, as Romans 1, 3, and 4 says. What was that like? What was that like? The heavenly choirs, the processional parade of... <laughs> of millions of angels applauding, bowing, praising, cheering, clapping, singing victory, coming before the throne of his Father. And the four cherubim, cherubim, the six-winged majestic seraphim angels, the 24 elders all casting their crowns before him, praising him in song and reverent worship, the seven spirits of God. This was undoubtedly the scene. God, the Son of God, the Father, had come back home, finally to Abba, his daddy. God, the Son of the Father, had come home. We here on earth, though, had hurt him pretty badly 
We had cut him and bruised him, hit him, crucified him, nailed him, spit on him. It wasn't the way God sent him to us. He sent him, he sent him to us as a gorgeous little baby who became a wonderful young man. But to the father, we sent back a child with holes in his side and hands. But father raised him from the dead. What was it like between Abba and our father, our Yeshua? Did father sit there in strict formality? Or do you think he ran out like he did the prodigal son? This was no prodigal. But it had been a while. And all the sins of the world had been put on him. I think he ran out. Or at least stood up. Greeted him, hugged him, accepted his awesome son. Joy and clapping and singing. Either way, God knows best, I accept it. Either way, how moving this must have been. All the victory recognition parades and White House presentations and Buckingham Palace Queen Elizabeth presentations would pale in comparison. What you see in movies would pale in comparison. The greatest battles, the greatest contests and wars had been fought. This was the greatest of all. You know, Satan only had to make him sin one time, and he couldn't have been our Savior. Just one time. Don't you think he was trying every possible angle to find a weak spot, a weakness, test him in every possible way? Yeshua had crushed the serpent's head, like he prophesied in Genesis 3. So though we returned him battle-scarred, boy, was he successful. Total winner. The joy, <clears throat> excuse me, the joy and the emotion that was being evidenced up there in heaven must have been just indescribable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what I celebrate on Wave Sheaf Day. Would you join me in joyful worship and prayers of gratitude to our awesome King on that day and our hero? He's our God. He's our King. He's our Savior. And He's our friend and brother. And He's not ashamed of me or you in spite of all we've done. Accept this love, brethren. Receive it. Love the message of it. Focus on him, not on yourself and your weaknesses and your failures. Focus on his victory. Focus on his success. Focus on the fact that you are being accepted because of him. Okay, we read it in, Le in Leviticus 23, verse 11, to be accepted on, your, on, 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 on his behalf. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, in Him, in Him, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now you explain that to me. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which, all everything he said here was about describing Jesus, by which he has made God, he, God, has made us accepted in the beloved. He has made, past tense, us accepted in the beloved. So yes, we're remembering his resurrection, but not as Easter, but as wave shift day, the biblical way. And we're accepting now. We're accepted by God now because of him, meaning highly favored. Accept is the same word for highly favored and loved, cherished, source of joy for God. Amen? Hallelujah, brethren. Get excited about this day. We get excited over mere football games or baseball games. Get excited about this. Make it real. 
People who saw Yeshua after his resurrection were willing to die for him because they knew who he was. By the way, if you haven't printed the notes and are just listening to this, there are going to be so many scriptures coming. You might want to stop it for a second. Print the notes. I'm on page 7. And there are going to be so many scriptures coming up. You may want to have those in front of you. We just didn't have time to get the audio, I mean, the, the video done. But Revelation 1, verses 17 and 18, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is talking about when John, the Apostle John, saw Jesus in this vision uh, of, of the revealing of the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation. In Revelation 1.17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. Father is also first and last. Yeshua is first and last. He says so right here. Father later on says he's the first and last. They both are first and last. I am he who lives. Now this is just Yeshua here, verse 18. I am he who lives but was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore now, he says. I'm not dying again. This is it. I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Okay, so it's, it's exciting to see, see Jesus. Imagine how excited the angels were to see him up there again in, 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 in heaven. So after that, though, sometime he spent up there in heaven with his father. It could have seemed forever and ever because they're outside of time and space. I don't fully understand that. But sometime in earth time, he did come back on that day. So Wave Sheaf Day, always on a Sunday, is not a feast day, not a holy day. But it is the fact, uh, picturing the start of the barley harvest, and, and Jesus came down on that day after he went up. Remember, the high priest raised the barley flour, the, the, the sheaf, and then brought it back down again. So my wife and I customarily have a quiet and joyful prayer of thanksgiving, thanking God so much for the meaning of all this. And then we get on with the work of the day. Anyway, Yeshua went to Father sometime after 9 a.m., and then comes back the very same day. And at evening, he came to where there were 10 of the remaining 11. Thomas wasn't there the first time. Um, he'd, he'd already seen Peter earlier. We're going to find that out later. He'd already, before this, had seen Peter. But now later that day, in the evening, he returns and they're all locked up for fear of the Jews. He appeared as flesh and blood. But... Notice, let, let, uh, let's read what it says here. Now, Luke 24, verses 32 to 43 is what I'm going to read. And they said to one another, okay, this is talking about the two men on the road to Emmaus, when they finally realized that they were in the presence of Christ himself, the resurrected Christ. Didn't our hearts burn within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and while we opened the scriptures, while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour, get, went back to Jerusalem, and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. So that implies there were more than eleven there, and those who were with them. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. So Simon Peter had already seen him too, because I'm sure Jesus was hurting for Peter, thinking, oh my, my, my dear friend Peter, He's probably beating himself up for having denied me. I need to see him first and reconcile and accept him and let him know I'm accepting him. So he'd seen Peter already. Imagine what that must have been like. Anyway, they told him about things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. As they said these, these things, Jesus himself suddenly stood in the midst of them. There's more than 10 or 11 of them, plus these two Emmaus guys and others. And he says to them, I love this. He always does this. He says, he says this to John. Remember, we read that in Revelation 1. Don't be afraid. <laughs> he says, peace, shalom. But they were terrified and frightened. Suppose they'd seen a ghost or a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It's me. It's, it's, it's I myself. Handle me. See me. Come on. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see me have. All right. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still did not have, while they still did not believe for joy and marvelled, he said to them, 
Do you have any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And uh, let's pick up in John 20. In John 20, verses 19 and 20, at the same day Sunday that evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst. I'm just combining this with a story in Luke 24 that by this point, the two guys on the road to Emmaus were also there and others. It says, they found the 11 and those who were with them and those who were with them gathered together. So there probably were now 20 or 25 people in there. Uh, not just the 11. But anyway, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now, somehow, even though he says, I'm not spirit, keep in mind that he appeared as a flesh and blood man whom they could touch. He could eat food. But keep in mind, somehow, he just suddenly appeared through locked doors and through walls and disappeared through locked doors and through walls. He was, of course, resurrected as a spirit being, but could manifest himself however he chose, as a human with bones or go through walls as a spirit. And he could suddenly appear and proclaim peace to terrify you or whatever he wanted to do. Paul confirms that he saw Peter first. I delivered to you 1 Corinthians 15, He's talking about the gospel that he preached. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8. I'm going to tell you about the gospel I preached. I delivered to you, first of all, that, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He died for our sins. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then by the twelve. The rest pertains to time after Wave Sheaf Day. And after that, he was seen by over the 500 and so on all at once. So anyway, let's backtrack again here. If you go to the story in John 21, the first 10 or 11 verses, sometime after this, some days after this probably, uh, he's up in Galilee. And, and Peter had said, I'm going to go back fishing, something I know. And they hadn't caught anything all night. Jesus is on the shore. They didn't know it was him. And he says, have you any fish, anything to eat? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. Well, he said, well, throw it on the right side. <laughs> and they caught 153 big fish, so many that it was breaking the net, but didn't break it. It was tugging at the net. And once Peter realized that it was the Lord, as John said, he immediately put on the rest of his clothes and jumped in the lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and was in a hurry to get there before the rest even got there. Let me tell you something. If you felt, if, if Christ, when he first had seen Peter, before he saw the other 11, the other the total 11, if Christ had chewed him out, Christ had really ripped him a new one, as they say, you know, if Christ had, if Christ had been really mean to him and rough on him, do you think Peter would have jumped out of the boat to hurry to go be with his friend and his Lord and his master? No. No, he, he wanted to be there with his friend and master. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that says a lot about Jesus. Because this day remembers about being accepted. So on the day when he came back, he accepted Peter back. He accepted the eleven. The words to be accepted. I just love that. Family of Jehovah, the Hebrew here is razon, meaning pleasure, take delight in, desire, favor, be accepted. Because of Yeshua and in him, you and I have become pleasurable, delightful, delightfully favored and accepted child of the highest. You don't see yourself that way, I'm sure. Because I don't. I get down and I think, I'm so imperfect. I, I, I'm so far from what I should be. How can I? How can God possibly take pleasure in me? But He does, because I'm covered by Christ. I am in His body. I'm part of His body. I, I, I am part of Him. We just have to learn to accept that. Now, 
why was the resurrection so vital? I thought he died for our sins. Wasn't that enough? Well, it was in some ways, but not complete. What his death accomplished is huge, but it wasn't complete. But by the death and resurrection, now the plan of salvation can start. Without the resurrection, the plan of salvation couldn't even really start without Passover and the resurrection together. It depicted the most epic battle, like I've said already, and all Satan had to do was make him sin one time. He lived to die. Yeshua came to live to die for us so we could have our sins and death penalty paid for. It's a song by Michael Smith, Above All. I, I, I love that song too, among some, some others he does and others do. His death and his blood forgave the sins we committed and still commit, but only if he was resurrected. If Christ was not resurrected, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 15 says very clearly, your, your faith is in vain. If there's no resurrection of Christ, then what, what are we here for? We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by the precious blood of the Lamb, Peter says. Not by gold and silver. That's not precious enough. We were bought back by the blood of the Lamb. The, 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 we were bought back, redeemed from Satan. Christ is now our Goel. That was the, 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 the close relative who would redeem uh, someone's widow. And he is now our Goel. He's the Boaz to Ruth. Um, I have a sermon. Go back and just type in Ruth in the search bar if you want to hear the sermon that explains the Goel and all that. He paid the ultimate price for you. If you ever wonder how valuable you must be to God and you think, no, he's, I'm just a piece of trash to him, um, you're so wrong. And when I think that way, sometimes I'm so wrong. You can't have a higher price paid for you and me. You must be a worth an awful lot to God to bring you back into his family out of Satan's hold for him to give up the life of his son, perfect son. God had two choices, remember. God had two choices. He could either let us all die the death penalty and, and just bring Jesus back because he was sinless. Or he could put all our sins on him who was worth so much more than all of us put together because he was God, son of God, pronounce him guilty, and he had to die for all of us, and now pronounce all of us sinless, guiltless, because of him. Second Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. Remember, it was the Lamb's blood that protected the Israelites from the death of their firstborn, by the way, uh, when God and the death angel were going through the country of Egypt, they weren't just looking for Israelite homes to save them. Whoever had the blood on the doorpost and the lintel was saved. Remember, the mixed multitude went out with Israel. I think some of those Egyptians said, boy, if that God of theirs is saying we need to kill a lamb and put some blood on the side post, I believe him. I believe in that blood. But this plague, the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, all the firstborn of man and beast, the firstborn sons, is what it was. It broke the back of Pharaoh's hold. I'll write a blog soon about the uh, firstborn. Is it sons or daughters or what? No, I'll write a blog on it. don't have time here, though. Exodus 12, verses 30 to 32 says that when Pharaoh got up and he saw his firstborn was, was dead, Obviously, that Pharaoh was not a firstborn. If you're trying to decide who the Pharaoh was, he could not have been a firstborn because he lived. But his son died, and that broke the back of his hold. They said, get out, just get out and bless me before you go. Exodus 12, verses 30 to 32. Now, what does the resurrection accomplish? That was what the blood and the death accomplished. Now is the Son of God fully, truly God. Yes, he is at this point. We're saved by his life. We're forgiven by his death. We're saved by his life. Because in him we also have the resurrection. 
because he now lives in me and in you. And he said he will finish Philippians 1, 6 and 11. You want to write those two down and read them over and over. Philippians 1, 6 and 11 says he will finish what he started in us. And verse 11 says we should be filled with the fruits of righteousness now, which are by your best effort. No, it isn't. What it says? Which are by Jesus Christ. And we're now a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And he's made us new. And he's made us a new life. I no longer live. Okay? But the life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, gave himself for me. So our big brother and Savior says, because I love you, you shall live. And because I live, you shall live. That's the importance of the life here. John 14, verse 19 and 20. John 14, verses 19 and 20. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. But you will see me. Because I live, because I'll keep on living after they try to kill me and do kill me, because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I'm in my Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. How unbelievably powerful that is. We should believe it. We're in him. We're now able to also say we've witnessed the resurrection because the resurrection of Christ now lives anew in us, giving us a chance to change our life, to be new, to have a new start, new hope. We still stumble, we still fail, but not like before. We are overcoming, I hope. We are obedient, I hope. We can't go on living the old way, guys. We can't keep doing the same old things. Those are past now. Those are behind us now. And now we're free from Satan, free from eternal death. Now we stumble. I'm talking about a way of life. We can't do those things as a way of life. So what a beautiful day this was. And that's why Paul says later on, all I want to know, Philippians 3, I think verses 8 to 11, I want to know the power of his resurrection, not just the resurrection. I want him living in me. I want the power of his resurrection. I want his righteousness. I want the righteousness of God by faith, Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11. Read those verses carefully yourself several times. So what I'm saying now is so important. None of this could have happened unless he was resurrected, accepted by the Father, and gave his approval, which then gives approval to the rest of us, that the rest of the harvest can be accepted on his behalf. That's the meaning of this day. This day also begins the count to Pentecost of 50 days. Leviticus 23, verses 15 to 17. You count seven Sabbaths from the Sabbath, from the day after the Sabbath. That's the weekly Sabbath. From the day after the weekly Sabbath. So we have a high priest who is not ashamed of us. We can come boldly before the throne of grace. And um, because he is risen, in fact, we're told in, in 1 Corinthians 15, I thought I had it here, but I don't see it. 1 Corinthians 15, that because... If, if he wasn't risen, then our hope, then our faith is in vain. We have no hope. But we do have hope because he was resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 21. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. Since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. He's the son of man, remember. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. I just read verse 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 15, continuing verse 23. But each one in his own order. Christ is first, the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ, those who belong to him at his coming. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts down an end to all rule, authority, and power. He must reign till all enemies are put under his feet. And so on. So what a wonderful, wonderful day this picture is. Now verse 28, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Now when all things are made subject to Christ, to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. When we're all there in front of God the Father and Yeshua, 
uh, is there in front of him, and we see the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, bow down, face on the ground, worshiping God the Father. That's how you worship. Way down low. Bowed down. And we'll also do that also. And in the end, Christ also surrenders everything to our Father, just like I said here. And because the head of Jesus Christ is God the Father, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Remember, too, that the message about Yeshua was central to the apostles' teaching. We find them preaching Christ over and over and over again. I, I put a bunch of scriptures in the notes, how they preached Christ everywhere they went. And they preached the righteousness of God by faith, not our own righteousness. Paul is saying that was what it's all about, Christ and his righteousness given to us by faith. Do you remember the purpose of Wave Chief Days? I've said a couple times that you, the rest of the harvest, could be accepted. And Ephesians 1 6 says that we are accepted in Christ because of Christ. God the Father has accepted you as faulty as you can be. As many times you fail as I do, because we're in Christ, Philippians, I mean Ephesians 1 6 says we are accepted by the Father because of Jesus Christ. Read the Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 6 again on your own. I read it before. This day, this wave sheaf day, not a holy day, it's a work day. It's about my Yeshua and yours. He rose from the heaven to, to the heavens to be accepted. Take time. Please take time on this day, April 17, 2022, and forever thereafter to acknowledge the meaning of the day that because of Jesus, you're accepted by the Father. So even though it's not a holy day, please don't forget it. Till next time, this is your brother Philip saying, walk with God, praise him for Yeshua, the first fruit, the first of the first fruits. May our loving Father grant you receive Yeshua as your personal Savior, your King to obey, your husband to love, and your life to live in you. Dear Father in heaven, oh dear Father, dear Jesus, Yeshua are our King, our Savior. We have a Savior. Jew, that's what your name means. Yeshua, Savior, Savior. We all fail so much. And yet because of you and your favor, your grace, God, that you bestow on us because of Yeshua, your son, we can come accepted by you and come boldly, in fact, before your throne of grace to receive help in time of need. Help us obey, help us love, help us seek you, Submit to you more and more. Help us wake up from any sleep we're in. Any lethargy we, we have. Any lukewarmness we have. Father, I don't want to be late as in. So many of us are, though. Forgive us of that. Help wake us up from our slumber. Change us. Help us overcome. Be truly new. Change us, Father. Thank you so much, Yeshua. Thank you so much, Father, for being willing to watch all that and not stop it, your own son. Hard to understand because it just means you love the rest of us so much. Father, we thank you, glorify you, we glorify you, Jesus. In your mighty holy name, Jesus, our Yeshua, our Savior, Amen and amen.